Hi there, it's Martin with from Martin on Mushrooms doing Neighborhood Mushrooms 2. This is a series of mushrooms that that we're finding in our neighborhood and in my backyard and along the river valley where I live in Devon. Um, so this is very pertinent to you if you live in Alberta or uh, anywhere in the prairies, as a matter of fact. Um, I found that uh, a lot of times when things start fruiting, they're starting to fruit everywhere. and uh, and we see that as a general trend. Just for your information, um, when I do my identifications, my go-to book is this one here, Mushrooms of North America by Helene Schalkwick. And, uh, and if you're lucky, you might have uh, an autographed copy of the original form of the book here, Mushrooms of Western Canada. Um, the reason I use this book is uh, because these, because this book has our mushrooms, the mushrooms that are typically growing in this area. And she's detailed them fairly well from, from little brown mushrooms all the way through to the big edible ones and whatnot. So great go-to book. Of course, from there, I go off into dozens of other things, dozens, dozens of other books uh, that we look at, and we'll do a video on that uh, coming up. In fact, what we're going to do a video on as well is uh, should I eat this mushroom? And that should be something that's coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, this, of course, is under the advisement of all the lawyers that are hanging around that uh, that uh, that want to warn you not to necessarily eat everything I'm showing you here. Um, if you do cho choose to eat a mushroom, um, make sure that you know exactly what it is that you've got and read up on it and uh, and do your own risk assessment and if you want to have at it you're on your own there um so let's get going um still around actually as i'm going through are some of the mushrooms we talked about in the last video um some of the puffballs and of course the fairy rings these are mushrooms that are going to hang around most of the summer um, as long as it's wet enough and we've got enough rain and in fact, it's been great with all the rain that we've had because we're starting to get some unique stuff that's that's popping up. The agrocybe is something that's more of a spring mushroom and early summer mushroom. That one is going to go away. Um, the tricholoma, I'm going to have a, a few little words on uh, coming up right away. And uh, and of course, the LBMs, they'll come and go with the rain uh, throughout the summer in the grasses. So uh, off we go. So I wanted to look at that trichelomaterium again because the first one that we photographed had been rained on quite a bit and was a little bit bleached out this is a little more typical of what it looks like a little more gray with that little brownish apex at the peak and of course with all these mushrooms you have to pick them flip them over and look at the gills and determine the spore print so in this case spore prints white white gills and the gills are notched and what we're looking for is where they attach into the stalk and here we can see that they notch into the stalk really critical in identifying gilled mushrooms is looking at looking at this these details um, again trichelomaterium big group of uh, of kind of gray to gray brown mushrooms generally fairly small this is a little bit uh, little bit bigger than a than a than a toonie and uh and the, there's a bunch of different ones that are kind of lumped in together um and that's typically unless you crack out the microscope you're not going to get much further and or do some dna work um so this is i very excited to find this mushroom um when i first saw it there i thought i had an amanita muscaria button one of the reasons when i when choosing to eat puffballs or not, they always suggest you cut it in half because when you cut it in half, if you see gills and you see a stalk in there and a bit of a veil, well, you've actually got a mushroom rather than a puffball. And in a lot of cases, you might have an Amanita button. And so you wanna make sure that you've got that nice solid mass that we've got here. I was very excited when I cut this one open because if you recall, on the last video we talked about the attachment of the mushroom to the ground so it's usually attached by a mycelial thread or it sits on a sterile base and here we've got the start of the sterile base 
there we've got actually the puff ball itself and the sterile base will get a little bit bigger as it lifts the mushroom higher up and uh, and the sterile base hangs around sometimes for years until somebody comes and kicks it over and uh, it's pretty a uh, tough tough thing again when we're looking at at puffballs we take a look at the the skin on the outside so here again we've got that really really thick skin and we see it starting to break up into scales so this guy here with this thick skin breaking up into scales sitting on a sterile base is a calbo vista subscalpta and we see this from the prairies and i found this right up into the rocky mountains and actually up into the alpine meadows as well um, the other one that sometimes you'll find is Cal bovista scalpta and uh, that one actually has pointed scales so these little scales that are developing here actually have little points on them very unique little mushroom um, difference between these two is uh, the look of the scale so good edible mushroom again when you cut the mushroom open if it's solid and white and it's a puffball um, then generally you're you're good to go and here is a bit of a surprise. So here we've got the shaggy mane, Caprinus camatus. And this is one that typically shows up in August and, and September and fruits in huge numbers. Here we had uh, one just pop up on our boulevard right out front, front of our house. And the one on the right um, is uh, a day older. And we can already see that the gills are turning to, to ink and uh, and at this point, I don't think I'd be choosing it as an edible mushroom. Um, with Caprinus, you have to be a little bit careful. The issue with Caprinus is that, that they usually grow in huge amounts. So when you look at the North American poisoning, um, <clears throat> the poisoning lists, this one shows up quite often. And it's mostly because people are overeating them. Um, but as I was mentioning, we're going to do a deeper dive into, uh, into edible mushrooms uh, coming up here in the next couple of days. So the shaggy mane, Caprinus comatus, surprised to see it this early. Um, but with that, we had a bunch of other little, uh, little Caprinus, little linky cap show up here. The one on the left, uh, Caprinus truncorum, that's kind of the brown version of the, uh, of the gray Caprinus atramentaria or the inky cap or Caprinopsis atramentaria the inky cap um, mushroom. Um, a lot of times people just lump them all together as one as, Caprine, as Caprinopsis atramentaria, um, but actually there's a bunch of different ones. So there's one, actually a bigger one that looks like this that has scales on it and that would be Caprinopsis flucosis and a tiny one, which would be uh, um, Caprinopsis lagopus, the hairs. Uh, Pears uh, inky cap. And the other lovely little one is this uh, Coprinox, Coprinopsis plicatellus. And this is this beautiful little guy, and he makes for the most beautiful little photographs. It's got kind of a translucent cap, and we can see the, the, the dark black spores that are developing on it. In this case, and that's what makes it a Coprinopsis, is that the gills just don't disappear completely like they do in, uh, in, the, uh, in the shaggy manes in the Caprinus comatus where they just completely deliquesce. So here again, the, uh, the spores drip out and you have this lovely translucent little mushroom that's left. The other one that we're seeing an awful lot of is agaricus in the portobello group. Um, and these mushrooms are kind of, they're easy to identify that gosh, I've got an agaricus. And they're obvious. One of the things that you'll see with the agaricus, if you break the stem off, it's kind of like a ball and socket stem. And it just pops right off really easily, typically exactly like this. Um, we'll always have a veil of some, court, some kind, either a floppy veil like this or a thick band, which they call a double ring, um, because it actually has kind of two veils attached to it. And, uh, and here again, we see that the gills are free from the stalk. So as, as the spores mature, they're turning chocolate brown. 
So when you buy a, a white button mushroom, it's an agaricus in the store. And when you buy it, you'll notice that the gills are white because the spores haven't developed yet. And they, then they start turning pinkish as the spores develop and finally end up this dark, dark uh, chocolate brown color. But always the gills are, are free from the stalk. Um, when you're identifying agaricus, they're a little bit difficult. They're really confusing. There's not a ton of, uh, ton of characteristics that you can rely on. So what you need to pay attention to is, number one, is the smell of the mushroom. Number two, how the mushroom stains. And... Uh, and again, what it's growing with, really, really important. So in this case, Agaricus campestris growing in grass. And again, where it's growing, whether it's growing in a forest or alongside which trees, in this case, growing in fairy rings. Um, when I cut this one on the right hand, you can just see that slight yellow staining that's starting to happen. Sometimes it's very, very faint. And, and also a really pleasant smell. So growing in grass, light stain, you know, generally a smooth cap with a few little scales on it. And sometimes the scales end up getting very depressed and, and a very pleasant kind of uh, anise smell to it. Um, sometimes the anise smell disappears, but it certainly doesn't smell bad and really critical that you smell these. Um, so this is the Garicus campestris. The ones that you wanna watch out for and that we have in Alberta as well is Agaricus xanthodermis. I stole this picture from, uh, from Wikipedia. Um, and here you see the bright yellow staining but the biggest, uh, the biggest thing that will help you define this is the smell, because the smell is unpleasant and kind of a phenol chemical smell. Um, there's a bunch of different mushrooms that are kind of in this group. They're a little more rare, but you can run across them. And sometimes the yellowing isn't quite as intense as, as you see here. Sometimes it's a little bit more intense. One of the ways to determine that as well is when you cut the mushroom in half, you grab it and then you just kind of rub it against each other. And then you'll see that the staining develop really important. So typically when you have an agaricus, you've got a choice of three things that are gonna happen. Number one, it's gonna, not gonna stain at all, or it's gonna stain red, or it's gonna stain yellow. And those stains happen immediately. You don't have to sit and wait a long time um, for that to happen. It typically will happen in seconds. Um, and those are really important characteristic. So the characteristic where you have a fairly intense yellow color plus an unpleasant smell gives you one of these poisonous agaricus that will give you some nasty gastrointestinal upset. Um, and, and pay attention, sometimes on some of the species, you only get that smell even when you're cooking and, and a really kind of unpleasant metallic taste. So be aware through the whole process if you're gonna consume these mushrooms um, to pay attention to these things. And if it's telling you something, it's usually telling you, well, don't eat me. And, uh, and uh, that's really fairly easy to figure out. So here's another one. And uh, this is, this I thought when I first picked it because it was so small, so, you know, basically it was uh, just, oh, a little bit bigger than, uh, than a toonie. The uh, very, very small mushroom, and, I, and it didn't bruise at all. So I bruised it here along the, along the stem. And one of the ones that, uh, that, uh, that kind of fits that description is uh, Agaricus uh, di diminutive. The, the diminutive agaricus. Um, but the thing about the diminutive agaricus is that it doesn't have any scales on the cap and here, and it's completely smooth. So it's perfect for that identification, except for scales. And that's the one thing when we're identifying mushrooms, we don't ignore every, anything. And uh, because if it's there, we need to, uh, to make sure that we've taken note of that. Um, so that's why 
I still think this is a campestris because of the scales. Sometimes the campestris doesn't doesn't stain very much um, because the, the staining on them is very, very light yellow and sometimes we don't see it. So I'm thinking that's probably what it is. I put a CF on it just because I wasn't sure. Again, didn't have the, the kind of almondy smell, the pleasant almondy smell, and it didn't have the, the stains, which are two of the signs that, uh, that give it away. So I'm not 100% sure on this. Um, and uh, so there it is. Here's the other one that's, uh, that's quite common. We've got a bunch of different brown ones. Sometimes we find some, some much darker brown ones and more scaly ones in the woods, um, Agaricus sylvaticus. Um, this one here is Agaricus brunescens. We also have a much darker brown one called Pattersonii. Um, and this one here, uh, when I cut it, you can see that that it's not stained yellow, but it actually stained much more red. So again, like I was saying, you have three choices for stain colors, nothing, red, and then eventually turning brown or yellow. Um, and so Agaricus brunescens, this is probably the one where the white button mushroom was developed from uh, many years ago. And again, very tasty mushroom. Um, and it seems that when you get them fresh and growing outside, they just taste so much better. The other one that we're seeing a lot of, or just the start of, are russulas. And russulas are another really difficult group. It's really easy to figure out that you've got a russula because russula typically has no ornamentation on its on its stem and the stem snaps like a piece of chalk and, you can, and cleanly. So you can kind of see what were that in the center picture. Um, Russellas are very brittle. And actually when you break them, you can hear it snap and you can hear it snap from half a room away. Um, so it's quite distinctive. The hard thing about Russellas are, is that the colors in the Russellas are water soluble. So the longer they're sitting out there and getting rained on, the more it's fading. So the mushrooms kind of on the, on the left-hand side are the same one. They started out a bright red and, uh, and they ended up fading out to just about nothing that you can hardly notice that it's, that it's white at all. So you need to kind of determine what the color was of it. Um, and then you need to look at the spores and the spore color. So a spore print is really important here. In the one again on the left, you can see that the spores have kind of turned it kind of a deep, deep beigey, just about yellowish color and really, really important. So three things when it comes to russulas. And in fact, we're gonna do a little deeper dive into them when we have a little bit more russulas fruiting and probably put that together in the fall when maybe we have a little bit more time to, to delve deeper into these. So with the russulas, the color of the mushroom is important. Where it's growing is important. The spore color is critically important. The smell is critically important. So some of them, like the shrimp russula, have a really distinct smell. And actually, whether it stains, and sometimes it'll stain gray or black, or brown. And those are really, really important characteristics when you're looking at russulas. Um, for example, on this one here, um, we didn't get to, uh, or I didn't get to a species name. The, uh, but if this mushroom had bright white gills and white spores, and if I tasted it, it would have a really hot bite like a like a hot pepper, that would be agaricus, I'm sorry, russula, um, oh, slipped my mind, I'll get back to it, uh, russula medica, that's the one. So that's the one that, that will cause some serious, serious diarrhea and stomach upset. And again, it's that combination, red mushroom, white spores, really sharp bite, and you need to make sure that you know all of those characteristics um, when you're dealing with russulas. And uh, so we'll go through those in more detail coming up. And found my first Lactarius of the year. Um, I think this one's Lactarius deceptivus. 
Um, Lactarius, in this case, kind of a funnel-shaped mushroom. This deceptivus may be because it might look a little bit like Russell Abreva peas, um, but when I did break it open, it had a little bit of white latex in it, so a little bit of a milk coming out of it, but not very much, which is typically very characteristic of deceptivus. Um, the other thing with deceptivus, which is uh, is that when you get it young, it's got a really slimy, sticky cap. And because of that, all of the debris, the sticks and leaves and dirt and everything that it pushes up to the ground to sticks to it. And, and uh, it works as a fairly effective glue because, uh, because very difficult to separate it from the cap. The only thing different with this one, um, which made me question it, um, Deceptivus is supposed to have a little bit more hairiness around the cap edge and, and and the top of the cap. And I didn't see that. It might be because this specimen is just a little bit older and that's kind of faded out and, uh, and, the, and the hairs have oppressed themselves a little bit more. Um, so I'm not quite sure on this, but it looks an awful lot like Deceptivus. And that's why I put the CF, which again means to confer about it. We'll love to have a discussion and, uh, and maybe we can get to a better decision. Um, the better decision would typically come with, uh, with, uh, with some DNA sequencing and uh, then we'd be absolutely sure. Another interesting one that comes out when there's lots of rain is this Amanita fulva. Amanita fulva is, uh, is actually another ringless Amanita, kind of like Amanita vaginata, which is a gray mushroom and a little bit thinner. Um, when I came up to this one here, the one with the photo with the knife beside it, it didn't look like uh, Amanita at all. And if I had plucked the top off and, and went off with it, I wouldn't have been able to figure out what it was. Um, and what I ended up doing is, is digging it out and we can see it down here. And I had to dig it out an awful, an awful long ways actually to see at the vulva that's coming at the base. So in this mushroom here, we get to see that the vulva is actually about, oh, an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half in the ground. So I literally had to dig it out of the ground to get the most important identification characteristic of it. Um, quickly, as you're walking by and you are familiar with it, you know, the striations on the cap will help give it away there, and the tawny color will help give it away as, as, amanita, as an amanita and probably fulva. And when we cut the gills, we can see, or cut the cap in half, we can see that the gills are free from the stalk and it's got a hollow stem with a little bit of kind of pithy, fluffy mycelium at the base of the stem. Very lucky when I saw this one because actually a bit of the veil remained on the cap as it pushed up through the ground. And we get that just like we get on Amanita muscaria, except usually those uh, veil fragments just end up as white spots across and you can literally peel those off. Um, so if you're lucky to see it like that, you probably know it's an Amanita. And, uh, and a lot of times it looks like this and you don't think it's an Amanita at all. Um, Amanitas, this one is one of the edible ones. Um, I generally don't eat them. Um, Amanitas have some of our most poisonous mushrooms and, uh, and, uh, and generally I've just had a habit of uh, choosing not to do that when I do my risk assessment. The other one that I was a little bit surprised at, not that I was surprised to see it fruiting in early July, um, is I was surprised that it was fruiting in the grass. Actually, mind you, it was fairly close to the to the edge of the river valley. Um, is Helvella crispa? So again, this is a ascomycete. Um, so what we have is kind of a cup that's flopped over, and uh, so part of the cup fungi family. With Helvellas, a lot of times, what's quite distinctive is that fluted stem. This is the white one, the white elephant saddle, as it's known. Um, it apparently is an edible mushroom, um, but like all ascomycetes, you need to cook them like morels. Morels are, are, uh, can, uh, can poison you if you don't 
properly cook them. Um, and same with Helvella crispa. So, but generally I've never eaten one of these, um, mostly because, you know, I typically find one or two and it's, and it's just not worthwhile um, to pick for the table. And here's another one typically that I don't see a lot. And this is, you know, thanks to this really wet year. So the one I found was here, um, Agrocybe acu, acuto conica. So this is one of the witch's caps. And this is typically a witch's cap that we found out in, found in Hinton um, on, the, on the July long weekend foray. Uh, very similar. And they look very much the same, except the Hygrosabe conica, the witch's cap, will actually bruise black wherever you've touched it. So basically somebody picked it by the stem right there and left their finger marks on it and bruised it. It quickly turned black. Um, a lot of times the edge of the cap will brush up against a, a stick or something else and, and it'll bruise black. The, uh, the acuto conica it doesn't. And uh, first time I found that growing in, uh, in the grass across the street in the park. So interesting, quite excited. Um, Hygrosabes are waxy caps. Um, and if you've never felt one, pluck the cap and mush some of the gills in between your finger and you'll feel what waxy is. A lot of mushroom keys will ask you, is the mushroom, are the gills waxy? And I spent, oh, several years mushing gills and thinking, is this waxy or is this slimy or is this what? And once you feel the waxiness of these, it's really noticeable. And uh, so do that little experiment. Um, it's not a poisonous mushroom, but uh, it, neither is it a good edible at all. It's kind of a bland, mushy thing when you cook it up. So here's another one that comes out in the rain when we have lots and lots of moisture. So this one I've been finding more and more of. Um, when I first started picking, I think I in the first 10 years I saw it once and hadn't seen it again for another 10 years and all of a sudden it's starting to show up. And it's mostly showing up because it's growing on my neighbor's lawn. Um, so I'm calling this, well, I started call, uh, off calling it uh, Boletus pulcherimus, the Western Satan's Belit. Um, and like a Belit, typically it's got this bulbous base. Um, and the Satan's Belits have the red pores underneath. And so this was a fairly rare mushroom. Generally in, in Alberta, all of the Belits that we have are edible to some degree. Um, this is certainly one that... Uh, that may be poisonous if we figure out exactly what we've got here. So in 2015, they changed the name to Rubroboletus. So if you see Rubroboletus in a book and uh, Boletus pulcherimus, it's the same thing, um, just a new name for it. Just to distinguish it a little bit because it's got some genetic differences. Um, there's also another one that's fairly similar that used to be called Boletus luridus and now they've named it oh the hardest name to pronounce after kind of after suillus so suel alus luridus and uh and so there's different ways of telling some of these apart you know one of the ways that you have to watch out for well one of the real distinctive characteristics is that when you cut it in half it's yellow as you can see here on the right hand side but as soon as you cut it it turns blue so as long as it took me to cut the mushroom and separate it and take a picture that's how fast that turned that kind of blue gene blue and another oh half a minute later it was that deep deep blue that you see on the bottom picture so really telltale sign is that is that bruising um, the other thing that's a telltale sign is this what they call reticulation which looks kind of like a net sitting over the stalk of the mushroom um, so here on this one we don't see any net and i went back a day later and we saw the spores or actually the pores um, become a little bit more red and the development of this network um, and one of the reasons why you always want to have a group of mushrooms so you can look at all of the characteristics rather than 
a single characteristic of one mushroom. There's uh, there's Neobolitus luridus as well, which is known, which is thought to be an edible mushroom, where this one's thought to be poisonous. Um, that has no reticulation; it's got a smooth, uh, smooth uh, stem or or stipe um, that we're seeing here, and that would kind of look like this one. But the next day, the mushroom right beside where I picked this one, all of a sudden the reticulation showed up. So pay attention to it. Um, I continue to call it Boletus pulcherimus or Rubro Boletus pulcherimus, um, just to be consistent. I'm not really sure exactly what this what this mushroom is. It could be Luridus, it could be Quilletii, it could be whatever. Um, some of the Luridus typically grow with beech and oak and, and some of the more exotic hardwoods that we don't have here in Alberta. They're they've known, but they have been known at times to grow with birch but typically with some of the other hardwoods. So it's, it's typically not the right habitat um, for them. Um, so it's kind of an unknown of what we've got. And at some point uh, we'll have to get some DNA work and find out what it actually is. And uh, before that's done, I'm gonna consistently call it um, Rubro Belitis um, the Western Satan's Belit. Um, and uh, until I'm corrected. Another one that pops up quite often are hebelomas. Hebelomas are, are a brown spored, kind of a clay brown spored mushroom. Um, David Aurora calls them the bums, B-U-M-S, kind of like LBM's little brown mushroom. Well, the bums are the boring ubiquitous mushrooms so these guys don't have a lot of characteristics when you pick them um, until you start looking a little bit closer so one of the things that's characteristic about them is the spore print the spore print is kind of a clay brown and here we're seeing the little little kind of dots of 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 exudate that's coming out of the gills and sometimes it also comes out of the stalk but here on the gills because the gill because the gills are producing the brown spores we get these brown water spots and if the mushroom's a little bit older the water spots will will dry up and we'll have just spots on the gills brown spots on the gills and the edge of the gill is serrated like a bread knife so again really critical features to take a close look at to look at the uh, at the gill edges and this gives us a hebeloma hebelomas have interesting smells um, some smell a little bit uh, like a potato raw potato or smell like a radish um, and when you're getting into species the smells are really really important um, in this case um, I'm calling this one Hebeloma crustalina formi, um, and it's got a little bit of flock use kind of hairs on the stalk in these rings, and so we kind of have this look of rings around it. Um, we've got another one that's fairly similar, a little smaller, Sinapisans, and uh, that one, the, the, the stalk is a little bit smoother, but a lot of times we'll still get those little dots on it from from the uh, from this moisture from this exudate kind of like little bits of sweat on the on the mushroom and uh, so a lot of times you pick this thing and ah, that's what you see so when you look a little bit closer also known as poison pie um, so typically they're not edible I know uh, uh, a group of people in the Italian community that eat these regularly and they're just fine with them. In Europe, they seriously poison people, um, which tells us that probably the mushroom that we have is something different than the European version of it. And, uh, and, uh, and we're gonna have to do some sequencing and figure out what this is. It's probably a different species. But in the meantime, again, I choose uh, not to eat this. Um, here's another common poisonous mushroom, Inosibi ramosa, formerly known as Inosibi fastigiata. And, uh, and again, it's a typical Inosibi. The common name is fiber cap. And when you look at the cap, you can kind of see it breaking into these fibers. And typically it splits like this. It's also got kind of a, a, 
a dirty brown spore print. So here the spores haven't quite developed. The, the gills are still, a, the gill is still a little bit yellow, but this is gonna darken. Um, one of the characteristic things is the smell here. So this inosopy has quite a distinctive spermatic odor. And uh, how do you describe it? Well, you'd have to smell it. And when you do, you'd go, oh yeah, I gotcha. The other one inosopy that I uh, that was growing in the area was this inosopy dulcamara. This is an interesting one um, because this inosopy, and actually you can kind of see it along the edge here and maybe along here, it has actually a cortina like a cortinarius. And the cap really is more kind of more felty on top. And it doesn't have those fibers like typically a, what they call a fiber head or inosopy has. Um, so not all mushrooms with a cortina are cortinarius. A lot of them could be inosopies. Generally, inosopies are much smaller. Um, and uh, so this is one of the easy ones. These two are some of the easy ones to, uh, to identify. In general, they're little brown mushrooms and they're difficult. Um, but there's some that, uh, that you can identify by sight. And as soon as I drop down into the river valley, we're starting to find some actually nice edibles. Uh, first heresium of the season for me. Um, and again, oyster mushrooms, the Pleurotus populinum growing on poplar has been out for a little while and uh, got some beautiful, beautiful uh, buttons here that uh, went into my smoker and made little smoked little treats out of them. The interesting thing with, uh, with these is that when a poplar tree dies, whether it's an aspen or a poplar proper, um, the oyster mushroom is one of the first colonizers. And after the oysters kind of had first dibs on the log, then typically the heresium will take over. And after the heresium, you'll get the the deer mushrooms, the pluteus, and after that, all the little guys, the inosopes, and and so it takes a community to recycle that tree trunk. Um, so again, um, heresium starting, uh, oysters carrying on. Um, we're going to do a little deeper dive into these plur these pluritoid kind of mushrooms, uh, mushrooms with out a distinct stem a little later on in the year when we have a little bit more time and some of these other things that may look similar and may look alike um, and and uh, we'll discuss that in a little bit more depth. Um, here's one of the corals, one of the few corals that um, that is, well I shouldn't say one of the few corals that is edible, um, but it's one of the few corals that you can identify without a microscope. So this used to be known as Clavicorona pixidata because when you look at the top, top of the, 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 uh, the top of all of these little coral stems, you have a little crown at the top. And, uh, and that's really unique to this one. They've renamed it Artemisis pixidatus. Um, and again, growing on older rotten wood, in this case on a birch, and growing underneath it is a gymnopolis. Um, it's a little bit old to identify, probably luteofolius. Um, very orange mushrooms, orange spores, orange gills, bitter to the taste. If you want to taste it and, and know what you've got, um, it'll likely be a gymnopolis um, if you're getting those characteristics. And because of all the, all the moisture and all the rain, um, on really wet years, you get to see these lovely Rhodotus palmatis. And here again on a fairly, fairly rotten log. So you can walk many years, many years and not see this mushroom. Um, and, uh, but in the really wet years, a uh, good year to get out into the, into the field. And again, typically growing on, uh, on aspen and poplar logs and they're older. Um, this beautiful, beautiful mushroom with the orangey pinky spores and gills. And when you see it, take a picture of it, spend a little time because, uh, because you might not see it again for a long time. And speaking of not seeing a mushroom for a long time, um, I was so excited to see this little guy here, this Mycena. 
Um, there's Mycenas all over, and Mycenas, again, are not notoriously difficult to identify. You know, there's you need to make sure that you've got the smells and a lot of the fresh characteristics, and then you need to put them in a jar somewhere where you can actually go out and get a spore print um, to make sure it is a Mycena uh, and and not some not something else. Um, so again, it's like dealing with little brown mushrooms, difficult at times because they dry up so fast. Um, so this one is one that I saw 20 years ago and haven't seen it since. Um, and when I saw it, such a distinctive mushroom, just about when it's smaller than this one, it's literally a scarlet color. And then it kind of turns this lovely orange and this bright kind of luminescent yellow. Um, Mycena acicula, I couldn't get the name of it. And I haven't seen it again for 20 years until, until this last uh, really wet spell that we've got. Um, when I look at it, it's amazing. When you look at this mushroom, you can see how small it is in my hand, tiny, tiny thing. And as the mushrooms made its way out, so it can actually throw some spores, um, see the strength of the mycelium, to be able to turn that curve, lift that cap up and, and allow it to develop perfectly perpendicular to the ground so it can properly release spores. It's a, you know, I think it's just an absolute feat of strength. Uh, some of these things have little corkscrews as they as they work themselves up through through the duff off the piece of rotten, in this case, rotten birch that it's growing on. Um, and there was a lot of them. And uh, this is the second time I've ever seen it in my uh, my life. Very very excited and excited to be able to put a name to it. So that's it for today. Um, we've got some other videos coming up. As I mentioned, I'm going to do one on edibility and just some general rules and things that you need to pay attention to. What you need to pay attention to, what you can ignore a little bit. Um, there's some important general rules, um, but you need to know about them and which ones you can, which ones you have to listen to and which ones you can ignore a little bit. That'll be coming out in the next few days. Um, and plus, as soon as we get a whole bunch more mushrooms, um, in the neighborhood, we'll have that uh, coming out along with some other things. Website still coming. Um, and, uh, and thank you so much for watching. Um, and uh, if you find something really cool and you want me to maybe talk about it, uh, send it to me. You can send a picture to Martin at Martin on Mushrooms. And, uh, and I might feature that as part of, uh, part of, one, of these, uh, one of these series. And uh, thank you for watching. And oh, right, um, they tell me, being new to uh, YouTube, that subscribing is a good thing. And if you like it, then you should like it. Anyways, thank you very much. Uh, glad to have you on board. <laughs>